September 11, 2001, I sat in a conference room with several other administrators to discuss the operations of our office. Shortly into the meeting, a knock came on the door. It was standard policy within the office that administrative meetings were not to be disturbed, except for good reason. Acting rather annoyed, I asked my coworker what the problem was. I was informed that our office had just received word that a plane had struck the World Trade Center, with little information immediately available. Believing this to be nothing more than an aviation accident, our meeting continued. Within minutes, a second knock came on the door, much louder and obviously with much more urgency. I answered the door. My co-worker had an obvious panic look on his face and asked that I please consider stopping the meeting. The situation was serious and certainly not an aviation accident. The majority of the office was already gathered around the television in the employee area. As we watched in horror, it was obvious that our lives would never be the same. As more information was forthcoming, we witnessed another aircraft hit the second tower. The reality set in that this was an attack on our country. Information regarding several other aircrafts and the possibility of additional attacks were revealed. Within hours, our office along with every law enforcement, fire, and rescue agency in the county was requested to have volunteers travel to Giant Stadium to assist law enforcement, fire, and rescue efforts. At this point, I contacted my husband and let him know that I would be traveling to New York. As always, he understood. However, he told me that I would have to make a second, more difficult call. That would be to my daughter. One might ask why this call would be so difficult. You see, my oldest daughter is born on September 11th, mm -hmm. and I was expected to be at her birthday celebration that evening. As I spoke to her, she asked, why, Mom, why does it have to be you? I attempted to explain that that was part of my job. As the conversation continued, my daughter asked, Mom, is this mandatory or have you volunteered? It would have been much easier to say that I was assigned, but reality was I and almost every police officer I knew were volunteering to travel to New York. Although not happy, my daughter understood when I explained that many people, including my brothers and sisters in law enforcement, fire and rescue, had already died. Ladies and gentlemen, when we take the oath to protect and serve, there is no clause that says only nine to five, excluding holidays and birthdays. There is no clause that relieves us from the obligation if the circumstances are dangerous. We as police officers, firefighters, rescue personnel know this when we sign on. It is to protect and serve regardless of the circumstances. Although she was upset, she understood and asked me, please, Mom, call. Just let us know that you're okay. Several hours later, caravans of vehicles were prepared to leave from South Jersey. As we traveled up the parkway, it was obvious that many, but not all the drivers, knew of the urgency of the emergency vehicles. Many drivers simply pulled over to the side of the highway, allowing the caravan to pass. As we continued north, all vehicles, aware of the massive police, fire, and rescue vehicles in route, pulled over. Passengers were out of their vehicles, cheering and waving as we passed. At one point, a driver stood by his car, waving an American flag. As we traveled north into North Jersey, the skyline of New York was visible. The billows of smoke were clearly seen. Large plumes of smoke continued to rise into the air. Areas of fire could still be seen. The occupants of our vehicle looked at each other in disbelief. Certainly for me, it was the first time I had ever witnessed such destruction. Even from a long distance, the magnitude of this disaster could be seen. 
As we entered Giant Stadium, which would act as a staging area, I was in awe at the amount of police, fire, and emergency personnel who responded. All organizations were quickly placed into the response categories to be deployed when needed. The organization and thought put into the rescue effort was astonishing. The command center was fully operational and ready to respond when called upon. As hours passed, frustration began to set in. We were all notified that the conditions were too, too dangerous to allow anyone to respond to the city. Buildings were still burning, and there was a high probability that more buildings would fall. Conversations were short, tensions were high, but the feelings of camaraderie and strength were thick throughout the stadium. The Red Cross attended to the needs of the volunteers, the volunteers who normally gave to others. As I walked around the stadium, the solemn atmosphere was overwhelming. Here stood a stadium of sworn personnel waiting to respond to what we do best. However, it was very apparent by the forthcoming information, it would certainly be a recovery effort not a search and rescue. As evening approached, information circulated that the conditions within the city were great. Shortly thereafter, orders were dispatched that the majority of volunteers would be released to return home. The rescue efforts by those waiting would not be possible due to the dangerous conditions. The atmosphere was immediately despondent. As we waited to exit, Various conversations began to surround the relationships with people who may have been victims in the Twin Tower attacks. During this time, conversations also drifted to the information regarding the attack on the Pentagon and the aircraft that was taken over by true American heroes and forced down in Pennsylvania, failing short to hit its target. For those who respond to danger for a living, the thought of not being able to help was devastating to us. During the ride south to return home, there was little conversation. Numerous attempts were made to contact my family by cell phone, which made it impossible due to circuit overload. The one promise I made to my daughter, I could not fulfill. At one point, I received a call, short call from a fellow colleague who responded as part of the National Guard. By his voice, I could tell that the scene he was observing was nothing that he had ever witnessed in all his years in the National Guard or his extensive police career. As our short conversation ended, he said to me, Lieutenant, I will never again fail to kiss my children and my wife and say I love you when they leave the house, and he began to cry. As the ride continued, the amount, size, frustration outnumbered the silence in the van. More than once, I saw the wiping of tears by my fellow colleagues. As we continued back to our homes, my heart ached for the families who would never see their loved ones walk through the door again. I would be returning to my family, and I would celebrate my daughter's birthday not on this day, but for many years to come. We would return to our homes and our families. However, I also know that our lives would be changed forever. I know that is the sentiment of every fellow officer that accompanied me. Ladies and gentlemen, I know I speak for my fellow police officers, firefighters, and rescue personnel when I say, thank you for giving us the opportunity to protect and serve. As I look out, as I look out upon the enormous amount of first responders from 9/11, and I, as I look out today at this gathering, I reaffirm my belief that darkness and fear did not and will not quell the spirit of this great nation. May God continue to watch over and bless America. Thank you.